next guest, Dr. Hassan uh, Teta, uh, who's going to talk to us about, boy, talking about giving. It's not only time, but resources, but it's even us, our own, I hate to put it like that way, <laughs> Dr. Teta, but our own body parts, you know? Uh, yeah. uh, the gift of life. Let's the put it that way. The life. gift of That's, life. Yeah. Welcome to Win TV. How are you? Thank you, Denise. Thank you. That, that is absolutely the best way to put it. It's the gift of life. Yeah. So um, let's talk about that. I mean, here you, you we, we have had um, Dr. Clive Callender on the show in the past. Uh, we understand the need. Well, maybe we don't really understand the need for organ donations. And this is, um, I think, National Organ Donation Month. And uh, what a good time it is to really let folks know that they can even put it on their uh, driver's license, you know, that they want to donate uh, in case of, you use the language because I'm about to screw yeah. it up. <laughs> well, it's, uh, you, you evoked a mentor and, and someone who's been uh, very meaningful in my life and career, Dr. Callender. So his, his, uh, uh, his work has uh, definitely been foundational in, in sort of bringing awareness to this month and, and also the need, as you said, the great need for a gift of life. Uh, so this is the month of National Minority Organ Donor Awareness uh, Month uh, in August, and uh, the need is great. Uh, right now, Denise, there are over 100,000 uh, individuals that are on a waiting list uh, throughout our country waiting for an organ. Uh, most uh, commonly, it's for a kidney uh, because of uh, end-stage renal disease, which has, uh, you know, unfortunately uh, caused the individual to require and need um, uh, dialysis. And uh, without, uh, you know, a new organ, uh, they have many years of dialysis and lots of complications uh, and uh, potential for you know not surviving very long. Uh, so uh, the need is great. Uh, there are many people on the waiting list, as I mentioned, uh, and uh, unfortunately and regrettably, a large number, more than half of those individuals are disproportionately minorities and, and even, even more so African-Americans. Um, and that reason uh, is multifactorial. Um, uh, you know, there's always disparity of, of care uh, among African Americans for numerous reasons, access to care, you know, not, not having uh, the uh, right referrals sort of in place, um, you know, and also uh, a lot of fear from African Americans to even go to the doctor at all, uh, with good reason. I mean, there's definitely a lot of history for, for why that uh, stigma is there. Uh, but all those things contribute to sort of this disparity of care and also uh, you know, more of uh, uh, more African Americans requiring or needing, um, uh, you know, this type of therapy, a life saving therapy, which is organ donation. And then on the other side, you have, uh, you know, the the lack of um, uh, individuals that are even aware that that's even an option for them. Uh, you know, when an organ uh, donor becomes uh, um, uh, sort of declared, it's usually a process uh, of of a number of things. But one of those things is the decision of that individual to make the decision to give the gift of life. And if that decision has never been made, it's never been communicated with the family, then that could be in fact a missed opportunity to you know, have an uh, individual have, you know, make this declaration to provide a gift of life when uh, you know, the time comes. So you yourself are uh, a surgeon. Correct. And actually do- um, uh, Transplantation. Transpl right, right. right. Talk, talk a little bit about, I mean, how do you have that conversation with the family um, yeah. to let them know, you know, what their options are? Sure. Very good question. And, you know, that conversation, I think, begins, uh, you know, at many stages. Uh, you know, one of the most difficult and challenging times, of course, is to have it when there's, you know, an actual tragedy, you know, sort of uh, confronting or, or facing the, the family and individual. Uh, so, you know, programs like yours are, are certainly uh, good because they can help generate that discussion well before the time comes. Uh, in my work, I'm a thoracic surgeon, and so my specialty has been, uh, over the number of years, uh, heart and lung transplantation. Uh, that's just what I was exposed to sort of over my career. And uh, it, for me, was very fulfilling to be involved in this kind of uh, surgery and this kind of, uh, you know, medical specialty because I could see uh, the the sort of way that the organ donation helps individuals really transform their lives and save lives. And, and I know with each one of these cases, we are contributing to saving a life and making a big difference. And it's even it even goes beyond just the recipient. Uh, you know, typically people that uh, become organ donors 
uh, uh, because of a declaration of brain death, a lot of times those are tragic events, unexpected events. Um, you know, every story is 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 just worse than the last story. And uh, you know, when people are facing that um, you know challenge, that crisis, this this great uh, trauma. Uh, and the families are, are sort of trying to make meaning of what happened. I think organ donation provides, you know, uh, many families a lot of um, a lot of grace and peace to know that the the loved ones, you know, passing was not in in vain, and that there was actually uh, something good that came of it. And uh, you know, if if the donor is, is appropriate and the conditions are right, you know, one donor can save up to eight lives. You know, with the with the gift of life, you know, with the different uh, organs. Uh, and I think uh, I've seen, uh, you know, that benefit and that uh, sort of great miracle on both sides of the equation that, you know, getting letters from families that had a, a loved one pass away and become an organ donor. And they're really grateful for the fact that, uh, you know, their, their loved one is now sort of living on in another person. And then, of course, the satisfaction and the, the great joy of uh, bringing a new organ to someone who's desperately ill and without that organ would probably die, especially in my case with heart and lungs. Our patients are very, very sick yeah. and, and they don't really have a lot of options. You know, um, uh, since COVID, I think we've been hearing uh, that more people are opting uh, for cremate to be cremated, you know, at, mm -hmm. at death. Have you seen um, uh, with that, I mean, now everything is disposed of, but have you seen more, um, or I know that that's why you're here to, to try to help more people or encourage more people to, to donate, but has that increased with the number of people who are opting now for uh, cremations? Uh, well, that's a very good question. You know, the the decision, uh, and this, is, this would be good for your viewers to know, the decision to be an organ donor uh, does not necessarily impact, you know, one's final arrangements, if you mm -hmm. will. So if you were to be cremated or buried, you know, the funeral homes are, 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 are sort of very well experienced with dealing with patients that will become organ donors. So in, in that sense, there really is nothing that changes much. Um, over the course of the pandemic, what we have seen, though, is uh, an increased uh, you know, need potentially for several um, um, individuals that, that uh, you know, are now uh, more susceptible, if you will, for um, you know, organ donation or need, or need for organ donation, in particular the lungs. Uh, there have been some very high profile cases over the course of the pandemic that demonstrate that, uh, you know, those that suffer from long COVID or the complications, the respiratory complications of COVID are, are you know, facing uh, situations where their lungs are so damaged that over time it leads to what we would describe as end stage lung disease. And, and they have required a, um, you know, a transplantation. So that's been very, uh, you know, sort of uh, ch uh, challenging from our standpoint to, to see something like that because most of the people that you know need or uh, lung lung transplantations their disease and course of of, 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 uh, of disease has sort of progressed over time but covid's only been with us just for a short time and and already people are requiring uh, lung transplantations fortunately the number is not high but it is something that gives a, a lot of us pause in the in the sort of community to just think about um, and then of course now we're testing all of our our donors for COVID to make sure that that's not transmitted to, you know, the recipient. Because, mm -hmm. uh, you know, when a recipient gets a new organ, they do have to take medications that, you know, uh, suppress their immune system so that they won't have any rejections. You mentioned um, that uh, about some concerns people have with visiting doctors and, and some of the history in our community. And, and there's a lot of, um, I don't know what you call it, um, fallacies maybe that go on or, or beliefs that people have about um, organ donate organs um, being involuntarily removed um, right. uh, that that white people may get black people's organs more uh, readily than you know folks within their own community or that people are out there organizations are selling uh, organs I mean what could you say to give folks comfort that you know this to, to ignore those things if we should, uh, right. and that there's a real process that goes through, one must go through in order to have their organs donated. Yeah, Denise, that's a great in question. I, I think that's an excellent question, Denise. And I think that the last uh, word that you use is really the, um, um, the answer to the question that would hopefully give uh, some relief and, and maybe some um, 
uh, some peace of mind to individuals that do have valid concerns, uh, obviously, for, you know, historical reasons, <laughs> things that they've heard, things that they've read. There is a process, and that process is very well governed. It's, it's strict. It has a um, you know, it has a, um, a great infusion of ethics and high standards to it uh, in this country. I know certainly that's not the case everywhere else in the world, but here in America, there is a there is a very strict process for that. You know, one of the things that was never lost on me throughout my career in medicine is that transplant medicine, uh, transplant surgery, uh, sort of the whole science around transplantation and particularly how we determine who becomes an organ donor and then who becomes an organ recipient is, is probably one of the purest ways of practicing medicine because everyone's involved. It's not just one single doctor. You know, typically when we're listing patients on a, on a list, uh, especially for hearts and lungs, uh, for consideration to become an organ uh, recipient, um, you know, they have to meet all the medical criteria, but uh, we have an evaluation that entails a host of people. You know, there are pharmacists involved, there are social workers, there are nurses. Uh, we also, you know, evaluate the family condition with the with the patient to make sure they have the support system in place. Um, and as far as like people that are worried about, you know, what will happen to their loved one if they say, "Oh, I want to be an organ donor," does that mean when I get to the hospital they're not going to take care of me because they're going to say I'm an organ donor? You know, that doesn't happen. That really seldom enters into the equation. And and much of that discussion happens well after anyone comes into the hospital. So I think people uh, should be rest assured that that that's not uh, you know that's not how it works. You know we 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 treat uh, patients that come into the hospital, uh, you know very much uh, you know like we treat all patients regardless of their uh, organ donation status. And that conversation happens much later as the patient sort of comes in and gets evaluated and determined what exactly is the condition that we're treating and taking care of and facing. But Dr. Teta, I mean, we we have that question on that driver's license, and Correct. many have have, including myself, have put yes there. Yes. We do we agree to be an organ donor? Was that just you know to, to answer a question, or who looks at that? Who determines if, yeah. if there's no loved one around? And you need that heart like right away. You don't have yeah. time for somebody to fly across country to sign a document. Right? right. How does that work? How does that well, work? And there's a process in place and so it doesn't happen like you know someone just rolls in and you know oh they're they're they they have to fulfill a criteria and 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 um you know here in the states and in our country that criteria is pretty strict it's a, a brain death determination you know for an individual to become uh, declared a brain uh you know a, a, an organ donor and that has to typically depending on the state have to be qualified validated through a number of studies and tests uh, and the determination to, you know, declare one uh, brain dead is 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 a pretty, um, you know, rigorous standard that uh, we all adhere to, and that is one of the criteria for at least brain death donors to to sort of satisfy. And so, when you're coming into the hospital for whatever the issue is, a trauma, you know, some unfortunate accident or something like that, uh, you know, that. Uh, determination of brain death is not something that's made right on the scene. It's, it's something that happens well after the initial care is rendered to that patient and individual. Uh, and then when that does happen, uh, you know, the brain death determination, uh, that conversation with the family and, of course, the designation of, of, of what the wishes were for the patient also comes into consideration. So, yes, at that point, yes, things will come into play. Uh, but right away, it doesn't happen like that. It's, it's really a process, I think. So, Okay. You know, the more people learn about that, I think that they they will understand. And and I think that one of the things that's very helpful for uh, individuals to try to learn more about what their decision should be is to talk with loved ones and family, and also to visit websites that have a lot of you know good information and and, and correct information about you know how important uh, you know designating yourself as a donor can be in terms of uh, reconciling a great loss, particularly a tragic one, and also what the, um, you know, reward will be when you know that, uh, you know, your passing or your loved one's passing has gone on to help someone in need and save a life. Well, I'm, I'm hoping that we can put something up. I think we have something, Sherry, where people, if they want to learn more information uh, about organ donation, I can personally say I've had individuals in my family who have been recipients Right. Uh, like you said, a kidney transplant uh, and uh, is living a, a pretty OK life. You know, everything seems right. to be working out fine. And um, as it relates to me, I have said, take it all. Now, I plan to be here, you know, at least till I mean, folks, I, we just saw somebody who celebrated their 108th birthday. I plan to be around that long. 
But I know there's organs, uh, skin is an organ, eyes, all of that, right? Are, right. Are yes, correct. So yeah, organs. beyond organs, there's tissue transplant as well that uh, you know go on to help uh, serve a lot of uh, you know a lot of individuals in need. Absolutely. Is there a point when your when your when your stuff is just too old that it's no longer useful? <laughs> Not necessarily. No. Good. Okay. <laughs> Just wanted to know because I can take that that yes off my driver's license. Uh -huh. I'm gonna be here, but you know I think it is important for people to make that decision to have that conversation. And is there a good time to have that conversation with family members? You yeah, know, I know that, when you're that, right when you're putting your will together, your life right. insurance, whatever. Is it a good? Yeah, time? That, that's a good question. I, I think there's the there you know it's kind of like the. Uh, a proverb uh, of, of when is the right time to plant a tree uh, yesterday. <laughs> so, you know, the right time to have that conversation is yesterday. Most people will defer those kinds of conversations. They're very difficult. And, you know, we, uh, you know, as a family had one of those conversations one time during a Thanksgiving celebration. And I will tell you, it, it turned as into- As you're carving up a turkey, right? I know, it turned into quite the, quite the, uh, quite the experience. But, you know, it, it, is, it is an important conversation to have with your family and your loved ones because, uh, you know, it, 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 it's, it's uh, very challenging to have that at the time when there is a, a tragedy in place, you know, right, but if right. you've had that conversation beforehand, I, I think that it makes the family's decision a lot uh, easier because they can respect the wishes of, of the individual that now is facing a, you know, a, a tragedy. Well, we can be grateful that, you know, there are doctors like you who can, um, you know, can, can use this gift of life and help uh, others, you know, to have a uh, prolonged life, even though, you know, you've suffered a tragedy. So we're, we're thank very thankful that you were here to have this conversation with us today. And we hope that folks will uh, follow through and, uh, you know, we will have um, what we need to save lives uh, going forward. So Dr. Teta, thank you. Well, thank you for bringing awareness to National Minority Donor Awareness Month, and uh, mm -hmm. and uh, your viewers and um, and listeners can go to registerme.org uh, to get more information. And uh, there are a number of websites and and lots of information online right now to sort of highlight and bring awareness to the month. Uh, and donate.life.net is also a great resource as well. Wonderful. Thank you so much for being with us, and keep doing what you do. Thank you. Thank you. All righty. Okay, doc. Thank you. Okay,